Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to our sharing on St. John's Gospel. Uh, I want to continue what I began in the last episode, which is looking at what St. John is saying about Jesus being wisdom incarnate. It's very illuminating because we have to go back into the books of wisdom and you will never read the books of wisdom the same once you realize what John is telling you about them. For example, uh, the first thing is that wisdom is identified with the word of God. And we're told that it descended from heaven and it came to carry out God's will. So let me read this text for you from Wisdom chapter 18, verses 14 to 15. When peaceful silence lay over all and night had run half of its swift course, down from the heavens, from the royal throne, leapt your all-powerful word, carrying out your unambiguous command like a sharp sword. Now, when you look at John's other book, which is the book of Revelation in chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, this is how he actually describes Jesus returning to us in the second coming. He says, I saw heaven opened and a white horse appear. Its rider is called Faithful and True. He is a judge with integrity. He is a warrior for justice. His eyes were flames of fire and his head was crowned with many crowns. He is known by the name, the Word of God. Behind him, dressed in linen of dazzling white, rode the armies of heaven on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike the pagans with and he is the one who will rule them with an iron rod. On his cloak and on his thigh, his name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So John is saying that this mighty warrior that came down from the heavens to carry out God's will is the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Secondly, we're told that they I'm talking about the Old Testament now in the books of wisdom, we're told that the, the word of God carries a divine energy, which makes it effective in its work. Well, when you look at the miracles of Jesus in the gospel, you're looking at miracles that he worked through his word alone, and they were effective in carrying out the, the, the task that was meant to be done. For example, you have... Um, the cure of the nobleman's son in chapter four from verse 50. Uh, and the, the child was healed simply by obedience to the word of God. The word of God was sent forth and carried out its work. You have the cure of the blind man in John chapter nine, where he said, I went and I washed and I saw. So again, the healing is obedience to the word of God, which was sent forth. Jesus said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man obeyed. I went, I washed, and I saw. Then finally, we have the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11, where Jesus sent his word into the tomb of rotten death and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came forth, obeying the word of God. Listen to this. This is Isaiah 55, verse 11. 
So the word that goes forth from my mouth does not return to me empty without carrying out my will and succeeding in what it was meant to do. That's about as clear as you can get. So the third point is that God's word was understood to be life-giving and to be healing in its effects. So John presents Jesus as the spirit, the creative, spirit-filled, life-giving word of God incarnate. So the fulfillment of everything that they knew about wisdom in the Old Testament. But we're not finished, we're only starting. The fourth point is that God's word was understood to enlighten people interiorly when they began to live it. So you find Psalm 119 verse 9 saying, how can the youth remain pure? It is by behaving as your word says. Psalm 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Well, Jesus wasn't just a lamp for our feet. He was the light of God in its full glory shining upon the earth. Not only that, but the word of God uh, was understood to be like rain that came down from the realm of above and it came down to soften the souls that were to receive it so that they could open up spiritually and receive what God said. Well, this is Isaiah 55 verse 10. Yes, as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens and do not return without watering the earth, to provide seed for the sower and growth for the eating, so the word of God goes forth and produces its fruit. What I want to do now is make a comparison between statements that are made uh, in the Old Testament scriptures about wisdom and just see how it actually opens up John's gospel. So what the Old Testament says about wisdom John is going to say about Jesus. Okay. The first thing it says about wisdom is that it was with God in the beginning before creation and was actually involved in creation. Listen to this. This is the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, from verse 22. The Lord created me when his purpose first unfolded before the oldest of his works. From everlasting I was firmly set, from the beginning before the earth came into being. The deep was not when I was born, and there were no springs to gush with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I came to birth. Before he made the earth, the countryside, and the first grains of sand. When he, when he fixed the heavens firm, I was there. And he drew a ring on the surface of the deep when he thickened the clouds above, when he fixed the springs of the deep, when he assigned the sea its boundaries. I was at his side, a master craftsman, delighting him day by day, ever at play in his presence, at play everywhere in the world, delighting to be with the sons of men. That's what the Old Testament says about wisdom. What does John say? John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things came into being. Not one thing had its being without him. When you go to the second half of the Gospel and Jesus is preparing for his uh, dreadful hour, he prays. He says, now, Father, it's time for you to glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So what Proverbs said about wisdom, John is saying about Jesus. The Bible says that wisdom is a pure emanation of the glory of God. This is Wisdom 7, 25. She is a breath of the power of God, pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, Hence, nothing impure can ever find its way into her. This is what John says in chapter 1 and verse 14. The Word was made flesh. The Logos was made sarx. He lived among us. We saw his glory. It was the glory that was his as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John chapter 2, verse 12, we're told, 
He let his glory be seen and his disciples believed in him. Point number three. We're told that wisdom was said to be a reflection of the eternal light. Of course, you know the answer to that one. John said that Jesus is the light. So wisdom was merely a reflection of him. Jesus is the full uh, manifestation of the light of God. Number four, we're told that wisdom descended from heaven and it dwelt in Israel as in a tabernacle. This is very interesting. This is the book of Sirach, chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. And it begins with, Wisdom sings her own praises. In the midst of her people, she glories in herself. She opens her mouth in the assembly of the Most High. And she said, I came forth from the mouth of the Most High, and I covered the earth like mist. I had my tent in the heights and my throne in the pillar of cloud. Alone I circled the vault of the sky. And I walked on the bottom of the deeps, over the waves of the sea and over the whole earth and over every people and nation I held my sway. Among these I looked for somewhere to rest. I looked to see what territory I could pitch my tent. And then the creator of all things instructed me, and he, created, he who created me fixed the place for my tent. He said, pitch your tent in Jacob. Let Israel be your inheritance. Now, John 1.14 literally says that when the word became flesh, he pitched his tent among us. He's using exactly the same expression. So he's telling you that he's talking about the divine wisdom that has become incarnate. Let's look at wisdom 9, 10 for a moment. The author says, Dispatch wisdom from her holy heavens. Send her forth from your throne of glory and help me to toil with me and teach me what is pleasing to you. She knows and understands everything. John tells us that Jesus is the word of God descended from above from the heavens, and that he came to pitch his tent among us. He was coming into the world, John says in chapter 1 from verse 10. He was in the world, it had its being through him, but the world did not know him. Now, saying that the world did not know him, the world was not in relationship with him, it was coming from below, it couldn't understand. So he came to his own domain, that's his own people, pitch your tent with Jacob. He came to his own domain and to his own people, but they did not accept him. But to all who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. In John chapter 3, verse 31, we read, He who comes from above is above all others. John chapter 6, verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. John 16, 28. I came from the Father, and I've come into the world, and I leave the world, and I go back to the Father. So he goes back from where he came. So you have this circle of love. It came down to the earth to redeem the earth, to set humanity back on a new course, of being in right relationship with God, and then love returns to its source. So number five, wisdom had a specific mission to teach, and it was meant to teach people the wisdom of above. What, what was it that heaven un, uh, wanted to communicate with us? And it, wisdom wanted to teach us uh, about the will of God as well. And she was considered a teacher of truth. You're hearing all these things. John says, Jesus is all of that. Listen to this. This is the Old Testament speaking now. Job chapter 11, verses six to seven. Were he to show up the secrets of wisdom, which put all the cleverness to shame. Wisdom 6, 18 to 19. Of her, the most sure beginning is the desire for discipline. Care for discipline means loving her. Loving her means keeping her laws. That's doing God's will. Obeying her laws guarantees incorruptibility and 
incorruptibility brings you back to God. This is Wisdom 6, verses 17 to 18. As for your intention, who could have learned it had you not granted wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from above? Now we're going to find throughout the gospel that the disciples have difficulty understanding Jesus and penetrating the mystery of his person until the Holy Spirit is given to them and then they understand. So we would not understand unless you sent your Holy Spirit from above and thus the paths of those on earth have been straightened and men have been taught what pleases you and they've been saved by wisdom. Proverbs 4.13 Hold fast to discipline, never let her go. Keep your eyes on her for she is your life. So John is going to present Jesus as the teacher of truth, the one who shows us the way back to God, uh, the one who reveals the will of God to us in all its glory. Now, number six, just as wisdom uh, taught through long discourses, you have Jesus teaching in long discourses in John's gospel as well. And in these long discourses, Jesus is explaining who he is and why he came just as wisdom was explaining who she was and why she came. You're coming on to much more familiar territory now because number seven tells us that wisdom was identified with the vine and Jesus identified himself with the vine in chapter 15. The book of Sirach chapter 24 verse 17 says, I am like a vine putting out graceful shoots. My blossoms bear the fruit of glory and wealth. Number eight, both wisdom and Jesus offer their food. And they tell us that this food is life for us. Both of them refer to their food as bread and wine. And both of them urgently uh, ask us to participate and feed. Okay, let me give you a few examples. Proverbs 9, 5, Come and eat my bread, drink my wine that I have prepared. Sirach 24, 19 to 21. They who eat me will hunger for more and they who drink me will thirst for more. The difference is that the food that Jesus gives actually satisfies the soul so that it neither hungers nor thirsts for anything else. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry and he who believes in me, will never thirst. In John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Let the man come and drink, because you can come without drinking. Let the man come and drink if he believes in me. As scripture says, from his own heart will flow fountains of living water. So number nine, Jesus will seek out disciples just as wisdom did. And he will instruct them in divine wisdom. In chapters 13 to 17, he will call them both friends and children, just as wisdom did. And he will offer them new life. So this is wisdom 7.7. 7. And so I prayed and understanding was given to me. I entreated and the spirit of wisdom came to me. And then verse 17. It was he who gave me true knowledge of all that is. Proverbs 8, 32 to 33. And now, my sons, listen to me. Listen to instruction. Learn to be wise. Do not ignore it. Happy are those who keep my ways. Sirach 4, 11. And you will be like a son of the Most High, whose uh, love for you will surpass that of your mother. So number 10, the coming or the advent of wisdom. I'm deliberately using the word advent because I'm thinking of Jesus. The coming or the advent of wisdom into the world provokes division and many reject it. Listen to this. This is Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 to 25. Since I have called you and you have refused me, since I have beckoned and no one has taken notice, since you have ignored all my advice and rejected all my warnings, 
I, for my part, will laugh at your distress when calamity bears down on you like a storm. So Jesus' incarnate wisdom, as we know, was rejected right from the very beginning. The leadership never accepted him, uh, not even in his birth. Uh, and therefore, uh, what the Old Testament is saying is fulfilled in him. Listen to John chapter 1. He was in the world. The world had its being through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own domain. He came to his own people, but they would not accept him. This rejection of Jesus, who was word and wisdom of God, had terrible consequences. And we're going to see these terrible consequences as we go through the text. But that text I gave you from uh, Proverbs, wisdom said it would laugh at the distress that people would have as a result of rejecting wisdom. But when you come to the gospel, wisdom incarnate didn't laugh when the people rejected him. In fact, he cried over Jerusalem. Not only that, but he sweated blood in Gethsemane because he knew he was the only savior that the Father was going to send to them. And if they rejected him absolutely, deliberately and consciously, then they had chosen darkness for themselves. And that's very frightening. And you're going to hear that right from the very beginning. John will show you that initially when they start rejecting him, uh, they become more and more spiritually blind. You have a very interesting discussion about this in chapter nine, where the, the leadership uh, say to Jesus, we're not blind, surely. And Jesus replied, blind? If you were, you wouldn't be guilty. In other words, I could heal you. But since you say we see, your guilt remains. In other words, it was conscious, culpable, deliberate blindness. And this was the result of their own choices. So Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 21, I am going away. You will look for me, but you will die in your sins. Now don't forget that the word of God is the voice of God himself. God knows everything about us. And you're going to hear this in chapter at the end of chapter one. And when he said to them, you will die in your sins, they did. It's frightening. In John chapter eight, verse 46, Jesus said, if I speak the truth, why don't you believe it? The reason for rejecting Jesus, word and wisdom were many, and I'll discuss that as we go through the text. But there's a very telling uh, text given to us in chapter 3 and verse 19. On these grounds is sentence pronounced, that though the light has come into the world, men have shown that they prefer darkness to the light because their deeds are evil. So the life and death that we're going to be discussing, not only now, but as we go through the text, has nothing to do with material life or death. Nothing to do with earthly life or death. We're talking about spiritual and eternal life or death. Listen to this. Proverbs 8.35 For the man who finds me finds life. He will win favor with the Lord. But he who does injury to me does hurt to his own soul. And all who hate me are in love with death. Now, this is horribly and sadly uh, reflected in the death of Judas Iscariot, which John, in his great kindness, leaves under a blanket of silence. He didn't have to tell us because the, the story had already been told by Matthew. So all I wanted to do uh, in this particular section is to say to you that the Old Testament is all over this text, but it's not obvious. That's why I wanted to point out certain things uh, so that when we go through the actual text beginning uh, in our next episode, then you will be able to see that this is very rich and that you're looking at the scriptures being fulfilled completely in Christ. Thank you for joining us. Sláin agus bánach dé live. Goodbye. God bless you. 
I spent much of my 39 years as a priest working with young people, and I've constantly found young people to be wonderful, yearning for something beautiful in their lives, yearning for peace, yearning for shalom. That's why I really hope that Shalom uh, Media will be able to communicate that message of hope to young people who are told to expect so little from themselves. And so I really wish the blessing of God to come on all of you who follow the programs with Shalom Media to ensure that young people will hear the good news of the gospel about a God who believes in us. So with that in mind, we ask the blessing of the Lord on Shalom and all that it does and on all of you who follow its programs right around the world. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>